Today, later in this dialogue, are four speakers Shana Fatina, Sutenia Puspalestari, and we are also lucky to have two artists from Europe Arts here with us Jimmy John Taidai and also Lavinia Kachel, from whom we will hear and learn more in the next one hour. And the session will be held in English. So, how this session is, work, um, is developed is that each speaker will do a 15 to 20 minutes presentation of their practice and projects. Then to follow up the presentation, we will have a question and answers with the speakers together. But before we get into that, allow me to invite Aaron Player, first secretary of the Australian Embassy Indonesia, to share a few words. So Aaron, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Nin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Selamat siang. Uh, my name is Aaron from the Australian Embassy here in Jakarta. Uh, on behalf of the Embassy, I'd like to welcome you here today uh, for the panel discussion on art practices for marine conservation efforts. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our amazing panelists today, uh, Jimmy Thayde and Lavinia Kachul uh, from Arab Arts, whose artworks you'll see here as part of the Ghost Nets exhibition, uh, Shana Fatina, for founder of Komodo Water, uh, Swatinia Polspa Lestari, Executive Director of Divers Clean Action, and our moderator, Ninjani, uh, Curator of Education and Public Programs here at Museum Machan. Uh, I'd like to thank our hosts here at the beautiful Museum Machan. Uh, and also like to thank everyone in attendance here and in everyone online as well um, to discuss the intersection of art and conservation. Again, on behalf of the Australian Embassy, welcome, and I hope you enjoy uh, the discussion and the incredible exhibition that we've got here today. Terima kasih. Okay, terima kasih, Aaron. So um, let me invite all the speakers to join me here on the seats. So let me call first um, Shana Fatina, and Tenia, and also John and Lavinia, please welcome me. And please give a warm welcome to all the speakers. All right, so um, Without further ado, I'd like to call our first speaker and introduce her. Um, this is Ashana Fatina, uh, sitting next to me. So she is the CEO and founder of Komodo Water, and she has a vision that everyone can drink and benefit from clean water and its derivatives through clean energy. She translates this by driving Komodo Water to take part in beating plastic pollution in coastal rural areas by providing sustainable drinking water and ice blocks. Aside from her active role at Komodo Water, she is also the president director of Labuan Bajo Flores Tourism Authority, and Shana has a deep interest and years of experience in the field of renewable energy and environment industry, water and sanitation, sustainable tourism, and hazardous waste management and circular economy. So today she will hear, uh, share about her work with Komodo Water. So, yeah, oh. Shana, whenever you're ready. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you for welcoming me here. It's been a while since I uh, back to Jakarta. Um, so I just arrived yesterday from Labuan Bajo. So I just started about what I do and my team. So we are Komodo Water, we are in Labuan Bajo base. And then at the moment, we are uh, trying to solve like a systemically solution for the fishermen and also for coastal society not only for water but also for ice to support their economy okay next so this is Labuan Bajo hopefully you've been there if you're not then you should be there because it's the one place you can see the Komodo dragons and in this area uh, many people focus only on the tourism but they forgot that they have um, this uh, community that living inside, there's three villages and they live with no electricity, no water access, and also less productive local potential economy. Every day they have to go further from the island, from mainland to bring water uh, using the uh, boat and then also have to bring, uh, to buy some ice for their fishing production. So not only they waste all the problem in Labuan Bajo because the tourism coming and also throwing waste everywhere, plastic waste, and not only that, fishing facility, fishing activities also contribute uh, waste, especially plastic packs to the ocean every day. You can see here to support the cold chains, it's only supporting 20% of the demand. 
and we see that a lot of fish are wasted. So they are catch, but they are not used because there is no chilling facilities to support these uh, activities. Therefore, they make these ice plastic packs from the freezer. 3,000 plastic packs every day goes to the ocean because they only use this ice and then they throw the plastic and they go for sailing and they will have uh, this number of fish that cannot last longer enough because actually the plastic ice only lasts only one day like that. So since 2012, we bring this company to with a vision that everyone can benefit uh, from clean water and through clean energy. Our technology is 100% solar powered, so we use solar powered uh, reverse osmosis and we use solar powered uh, ice block machines that you can see and we bring this as an integrated uh, solution for water management in remote area, especially for coastal, that not only for finding the right uh, water, but also providing this water for supporting productive, tech productive economy, for example, for tourism, agriculture, or fishing itself. So in a nutshell, we have this our technology in reverse osmosis using solar power and ice block machine that use no more plastic packs. And the production of the ice lasts longer, three days longer than the other one. So the fishermen can have more productivity activities in fishing the area. So looking to that, people always ask, why you always, why you also tackling down on the waste issue? Because it's just related. First from the water, and water have plastic bottle, water have this ice and then have plastic packs. And that's why we want to support the circular economy in the area. So why we now uh, developing our traceability apps application to know where is your plastic waste come from and how it goes and how we can reduce it. So we also have this small program with the community, how to redeem your collected waste to one gallon of water. So especially for the local people, local children, so they will know from the start that this plastic pest cannot last long in the environment, so you have to solve on that issue. So since Labuan Bajo also a touristic area, we work together with the hotels, with the dive centers to uh, tell them about how we can fight this together more. So that's why we met plastic packs from into like this, like keychains. So all these uh, plastic waste we collected and then we worked together with them and campaigned together. We made a coaster, keychains, we made jewelry, how to attract more, um, more common people yeah, to aware about Labuan Bajo. So why we, we do these matters? The first one for environment impact, up to 50 tons CO2 emission avoided per year up to 15,000 liter fossil fuel avoided per year because we use 100% solar power. And then also up to uh, 1,000 kilowatt hour energy save per year, 10,000 liter water saving per year. Why water is safe? Because we use with the same water, it lasts longer the ice. So you can imagine if you, we use uh, our ice, it's better than you use other ice because our ice can ice twice or three times uh, better than you with the same ice, with the same water, you can produce the same, uh, the longer ice uh, for the coolant system. And of course, we avoid the one plastic use single plastic and this is good for environment, not only for the tourism, not only for the fishermen, but also for the ecosystem. And last but not least, this is our impact so far. So we have these 3,000 uh, more uh, and 10 villages like, supporting us at the moment. We have delivered 100,000 more uh, water gallons to everyone and we also reduced uh, the single-use plastic use per, uh, for 40 tons. And then um, the use of the solar powered and also we produce the plastic waste and create local jobs. Our technology are really easy to be used and it's 100% uh, operated by the local people. And at the moment, we have three area, Papagarang in the Komodo National Park, Bari in the north center of the Labuan Bajo, and Nagekeo in Kawa is a mainland that going to be a traditional villages for tourism uh, sector also. So in the future, um, we are looking forward for collaboration, of course, because we're aiming at today 10,000 water data. You never know that your water won't last forever. So water is not always there. It, if you can uh, rejuvenate it, then it will be gone just now and you when it happens then there's a point of no return so that's why it's important for us now to conserve and to identify where is our water coming from how it's go is the hydrological uh, cycle is going well 
And that starts from our, um, our work at uh, the moment. So we're collecting 10,000 water data in the area. And hopefully, in the future, we will know uh, what can be done to manage water sustainably and more wisely. So this is my team. Uh, and also, now we have uh, not only engineer side, but also digital side. So I hope in the future, we can collaborate together. Last but not least, because I am here, because supported from the Chis Hyrule project, so they have this incubator and accelerator for especially blue economy. The sectors is now is going to grow, and people start to see the cold chain, how people manage the sustainable fishing, sustainable uh, water management, and how the coastal area becoming adapt to the climate change. And this is uh, the more information. If you guys want to also join the accelerator, then we will be in the same team, in the same working group to make uh, the future better than today. That's all from me. Let's collaborate and let's deliver sustainable in a real way. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sh Shanna, for presenting um, your project with Komodo Waters. So it's, um, well, I have some uh, questions about access to clean water, and I'm sure uh, you have too. But um, before that, uh, let's move on to our second presenter of the day, um, who is Switenia Pispalestari, or um, as uh, we call her, Tenia. So she is the co-founder and executive director of Diverse Clean Action, a youth and community CSO with over 1,000 volunteers across Indonesia and the region of Southeast Asia. DCA, or Diverse Clean Action, is involved in marine and coastal conservation programs, focusing on specifically marine debris research, campaigns, community development, and also CSR and EPR facilitator to achieve circular economy goals in combating marine debris. Tenia is listed among top 100 BBC Influential and Inspiring Women 2019, Forbes 30 Under uh, 30 Social Entrepreneur Asia 2020, One Young World Mary Robinson Climate Justice Award 2021, and World Economic Forum Global Action Partnership Plastic Action Champions 2021. So without further ado, um, Tenia, um, you actually have um, 15 to 20 minutes. So you know, if you want to take your time, please do. OK, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you can call me Tenia, and I'm just going to remind you that uh, my talk will be quite simple compared to Kashana because the committee asked me to explain or share uh, and give the inspiration that actually youth or the community in Indonesia can do something. Um, so I'm going to just slightly share on how me as an individual and then also Diverse Clean Action, my foundation, can do something and collaborate with you guys after um, the museum visit today. Um, that's the brief information first. Um, so um, just like what you saw um, in these pictures behind me, um, I want to ask you whether is there any scuba divers here? Scuba divers, please raise your hand. OK, not that much, but we have several. OK, so that's what we do usually. Uh, we are uh, the people that loves to do scuba diving. And as you can know, Indonesia is one of the heaven for tourism in scuba diving. Uh, but that's the background of how our foundation is initiated, uh, was initiated back in 2015. So not only the beautiful scenery or like the Nemo fishes that we can see, but actually um, highlighted, sorry, I cannot use this that way. Oh, okay. Yeah, so highlighted be uh, below the water, we usually have several spots that have a lot of marine debris. Um, it's very, uh, not only the ghost, uh, ghost fishing gears or like the fishing gears that is left behind, just like we, what we saw uh, on this art installation today, but we also saw a lot of single-use plastic packagings like what Kachana said. And other than that, actually, our clothes, clothing items like fabrics, they are also found a lot um, in Indonesia's um, ocean. Therefore, our daily lifestyle decisions is really important um, to really do something about it. Okay. Um, and we're talking about how we can do something uh, in our daily lifestyle, right? If we're talking about uh, our daily life that 
uh, live not in the ocean or coastal area such as in the city like this Jakarta we might not find the ocean or the marine debris every day but we actually uh, contribute something because if we produce a lot of single-use plastic that can actually not really 100% recyclable usually it is being tossed or uh, dumped um, to the area that is not the landfill so usually they go to the river and then goes to the oceans just like um, the pictures that can be shown later on um, so usually this area uh, are the highest uh, possibility for um, ocean debris that goes to the oceans we're still waiting for the pictures um, but with that uh, background so everything that we decided um, since our uh, lifestyles in our own house or when we want to shopping it's really going to affect our oceans and based on that um, scuba divers cannot only focusing on marine debris just like for example cleaning up every day because the ocean waste will be there uh, as well therefore we also focusing our works into several um, topics such as climate changes and then also sustainable fisheries etc as you can see on this um, topics and the next slides, you can see um, the examples of what we're doing, uh, where we usually collaborate with um, volunteers and then also university students uh, where we do research. Um, you can see here we do microplastic sampling. So maybe in Jakarta, you can go to Muara Angke in the northern part of Jakarta. Uh, you can go with us and then strolling around the mangrove forest, but you can also collect microplastic samples. Because as you know, perhaps know now, um, some of the shells um, usually already contain microplastic, 100% of it in Jakarta. So we can be more careful as well uh, in terms of our health. And the other one is the macroplastic samplings that we usually do uh, because this kind of waste is um, coming from from other country as well, not only from Jakarta or Indonesia. Um, these are the other um, activities that we do, such as reductions. Um, so we initiated some um, carnivals, some festivals, where individuals can go to the street together, usually during Plastic Free July, where we as consumers can speak out our minds, speak out our solutions that we need alternative solutions from private sectors. Um, these private sectors can actually change their packaging, such as uh, providing refill stations. So now you can actually buy your shampoos, soaps, detergents, etc. Um, by not um, providing any single-use plastic packaging like this. Uh, and not only in the national policy changing um, um, solutions that you can take part on, but you can also take part on small um, uh, travelable shops where we actually initiated uh, on the islands of Kepulauan Seribu. These are the pictures. Can I go to the previous screen, please? Yes, these are the examples of not only those that have higher income that can purchase things um, through refill stations or refill stores, but also those that live in the lower to middle income community. Now can they, they can actually save money by actually pr uh, purchasing stuff on bulk. Um, and then the next um, slide you can see we also develop waste bank communities so usually in the area that you uh, live now in Indonesia we have waste bank where you can actually put your waste uh, and separated it and then you can actually gain money and saving out of it uh, and we make sure that this recyclable can go to the recycling industries and then can be changed into a new products by the FMCG companies etc um, and this is the example of a house where you can actually see it's actually made out of styrofoams and single-use plastics and the next slide this is our highlights um, based on our volunteers and staffs now we have uh, several programs in Indonesia and also Southeast Asia regions and it's not only talking about waste uh, but also trying to provide ecotourism packaging um, to the tour guides community etc so we're, we're working on coral transportation as well and mangrove transportation as well next slide um, and because I'm representing of the alumni uh, of Australia Awards um, in Indonesia, there's also a lot of short courses that you can take from the Australian government. And I got the privilege to go uh, for the short course uh, about tackling marine debris issues, um, where I got the understanding of the importance of social marketing and behavior change on it. So 
the Australia and Indonesia do a lot of things and social marketing or the behavior change aspect is really important and you can take part of it as well to make more people understand and change more their behaviors. Next slide. Um, and one of the important uh, points about behavior change is combining the local wisdom with um, the campaign or communication parts. Um, as what we understand based on our alliance on the Asia Pacific region, um, Indonesia and other countries actually have a lot of local wisdom that can actually inspire more fishermen perhaps not to dump their fishing gears on the oceans, uh, etc. So I think uh, there's also an opportunity here if you have any works on making sure that local wisdom can be understood more by the local public. Next slide, um, and this is just the last slide where one of the examples of we, uh, what we do on the community development programs in Bali is trying to collaborate or um, um, try to connect the dots between the local wisdom, um, the local um, incentives, uh, where they are making stuffs for their prayers, but using plastic waste that they found on the beach area, and it's actually sellable in the galleries or art galleries in Bali. So we really appreciate what, what have been doing by IRAP, because that's what we also do here in Bali, uh, and it's actually a good opportunity or a good uh, door for more people to be understand and also to support uh, movements like this. So I think that's about it, about what we do, and looking forward uh, to discuss and collaborate after this museum visit. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Penia. So, so far we've um, heard about the uh, issues in our oceans, um, such as the plastic waste and also the marine debris. And so, um, our next session, uh, we'll sh hear more about the, uh, um, the practice done by Europe Arts, who's been transforming all this um, um, plastic waste and marine debris into a uh, work of arts that you've seen in the, uh, our um, children's art space gallery with this exhibition. So before um, I move on to Jimmy and Lavinia, I'd like to um, introduce more about Europe Arts. So Europe Arts, uh, they work to promote and revitalize the traditional cultures of the Arabam people of Torres Strait through art. And engaging with communities from the four clans um, of the islands, Europe Arts draws artistic inspiration from traditional stories and contemporary challenges about their ancestral lands, seas, and the sky. And the initiative started in the 1990s, but since 2011, the artists from Europe Arts have been transforming ghost nets into artworks to raise awareness of the environmental issues across Torres Strait. So as uh, the first incorporated art center in Torres Strait, Arab Hearts focuses on providing community learning, skills development, career support, and enterprise opportunities within the Arab community. And today, Arab Arts creative practice continues to evolve through a collaborative approach that celebrates cross-cultural exchanges and also educational programming for all ages. And the um, regarding uh, the collection that you saw, uh, that you see in the exhibition today, the, it's inspired by the rescue efforts done by the Islanders, Indigenous Land and Sea Rangers, who have made um, rescue efforts to save aquatic species, such as the manta rays and also um, stingrays, which inspires the sculpture collections that you see. So joining us today, we have um, two artists from the collective, Jimmy John Taidai and also Lafinia Ketchel. So please give a warm uh, round of applause um, before they share. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Lavinia Kettrell. So I'm an artist from the Torres Strait. Um, we come from a tiny island with a population of about 400 people. And um, our island is surrounded by um, beautiful beaches and coral reef. So um, doing this, um, the Ghost Network, we want to um, spread the message of uh, we just want to like re recycle um, the net so the net is um, bad for the ocean so we're turning it into something um, good um, the, the patterns that you see on the um, works inside is uh, patterns that we see on the um, in the reef um, in how the tide moves and so we have a lot of circles and um, 
Yeah. So yeah, how do you um, find yeah, inspiration uh, from that into uh, the artwork? Like, do you what's the process? Can you walk us through the process? So when you see the uh, patterns in C, and then how you turn it into the patterns of the rays, maybe. Um, just yeah, the um, the the patterns that we see, like we can um, we draw, we plan our work, and then. Um, put it onto um, the ghost network. I see. So um, in this process, uh, we've been, in the past two days, you've been, do, uh, you've been doing uh, school workshops with school students. Uh, do you want to share about this experience uh, doing the workshop with students? Uh, hello, my name is Jimmy. And as for the workshop, we always try to encourage young people to um, keep Keep, keep, keep in mind that there's a life that you got to recycle, otherwise we always think about the generation of us because it's always the generations that's going to come later and, and um, put, put things in line. Otherwise, if, if, we, if we don't do them, them bits and pieces of things, our generation is going to sit there, watch TV on the phone. It, it, we're trying to take them out of that, that, that lifestyle and bring back to recycle what, what's out on the reefs and on the beach. So that way we don't have to s tell the young ones to sit in the TV or go out and play that. No, I want to play this, I want to play this. So the, 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 the module of recycling is to encourage and make sure our generations got that opportunity to do what we, we, we are trying to do. Otherwise, the, 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 mo the things just going to keep on build up and build up like Plastic is going to come, nest is going to go everywhere, and, and we won't have nothing to, we probably just go cut trees again, like our ancestors when they started it. So it's a good way to encourage kids to, our generation to start recycling now and try and help that at atmosphere. Like, as you can see, it's climate change. So the reason why we start doing ghost net is to um, try and help and recycle and try and save our our anim our food source to for the younger generation. So that way, if they come down here and bring your your younger generation generation up there, so that way our generation can tell stories that it's been our uh, our ancestors been doing it for a long time. So that's why we have to um, encourage our generation to start recycling and help help the environment. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as you can see here, is the, the works that is exhibited in the exhibition. You can see there are different uh, techniques, um, uh, and each ray is very different. So, I want to ask, like, how did you find the um, idea for the technique itself? Because in the workshop, you also um, guide children to do it step by step. Is it a um, traditional uh, weaving technique, or um, it's something that you also invent? No, it's a, it's a traditional technique, like like even for Indonesia, how you weave coconut leaf. It's, it's, it's all started off with coconut leaves. I was still starting to weave, cooking coconut leaf, and that experience it goes into into a pattern that you want to start and build and teach our, our young generation how to stitch. Uh, as you can see, we had that big group of students here today. They were so excited to do that, do that, that workshop. And when soon as one of the one one of the teachers says, oh, "It's time," now, everybody's go, "Ah, oh, see, <laughs> that's that's that, that's to tell us that they are enjoying that artwork, and we also like build confidence for little young young people to." And as for the big ones, we also do, do little kits. Like once the cardboard starts, so we make up all kits, send, send them out to right around Australia, even, even the Antarctic, Canada, even, even they even do workshop and they send the kit back and that's where we put it. Our, our artists get together, plan it and do the skin of it and just Create, create a beautiful thing that it's 
killing our animals and our food source. As for the little ones, we don't have much material on the island, so we use power line. Power line, like we've got power line running up, we've got Aegon mob coming out, changing, changing lines, but when, when they take the power line back, they just want to take it back to burn it. So we, we go up and can we re do, the, do use of it as in recycling it? And that's how we, we get to do the, those little ones. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that doing all the frames, like get the shapes done and I just pass it to the ladies. This is the, one of the youngest ones. We have four, four elders in our, in our group and we try to encourage more young people to step up and do what we try to help everybody. So that way we've got a better life of a beautiful beach or a beautiful reef. Yeah. Right. So uh, perhaps um, one last question before I open up the question session with the other speakers. Uh, so this is your first exhibition in Indonesia, but you also have been uh, exhibited uh, elsewhere in Australia, in other countries. Uh, how is this um, project different? Uh, what's, your, um, yeah, uh, what's your impression of your experience here? Food. <laughs> food? <laughs> food and the food. people. Mm. They have a beautiful smile and we all connect together. That's how we get to know families. <laughs> yeah. The people and everybody you are. Especially the food. Not KFC, McDonald's. Do you have a favorite food, Jimmy? The satay. Satay? <laughs> <laughs> and and also we are duck for lunch. So like the beautiful animal but the best taste is. Yeah, if, if you want to add on, um, Lavinia, what's your impression here um, in Indonesia? Um, I think the, the people, like, the, um, you guys are also, like, welcoming, and, yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, we love to welcome you. <laughs> and the traffic. Oh, and the traffic. Oh, welcome to Jakarta. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm sure you have uh, more questions, um, but yeah, to move on from the, uh, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing your, uh, a, a glimpse of your practice. So I'd like to move on to the second part of the session today is the question and answer. So um, actually I'd like to um, ask all uh, our three speakers um, the same question first. So um, it's actually something that uh, Tenia has brought up. Uh, so uh, we, as people who live in the city, uh, the issue about like marine debris and ocean pollution, it's not something that we deal with every day. Um, but uh, as, as it turns out, we, we actually contribute a lot to um, the pollution that ends up in the ocean. So um, what can we do actually to uh, contribute to solutions? Because it's very hard to avoid plastic, it's everywhere. So yeah, is, is there anything practical that we can do? Um, yeah, so I'd like to maybe like Tanya first and then uh, yeah, move on. Ladies first. Ladies first, thank you. Um, yeah, other than joining communities like Diverse Land Action, <laughs> um, you can also do several things uh, by yourself. Like what I mentioned earlier, maybe the three R is kind of like cliche, but it's actually true. Um, and actually just like what you mentioned earlier, we cannot leave plastic like 100%. Because even my glasses, the, the, the textiles are usually also um, combined with plastics. Uh, but if we have the mindset of the 3R, the reduce, the reuse and recycling, we can actually um, make the single-use plastic become less and less produced. Because, you know, we bring your bottles everywhere and then you can actually bring your food containers. And if you're shopping, you can bring your... Um, shopping bags, a reusable one, um, and that can actually mean something. Uh, but again, it's not enough. Um, so, you know, as a consumers, especially, we have a saying for the, the private sectors. So, you know, you can fill out some um, petition online uh, to make your favorite brands uh, to change their packaging, um, sort of like um, your favorite shampoo, your favorite soaps, they can actually provide alternative solution without single-use sachets or single-use plastic bottles. Um, so we as the consumers still can buy it uh, with less pollutions. I think that's uh, what's the most important because if only activists or like 
several um, artists that uh, talk something about it, it will not be heard as loud as usual public if you're the one that's saying it because you're the consumers. So I'm persuading you after this museum visit, you can check out the petition of Pawai Bebas Plastic as well, uh, where you can actually show the support uh, for the Indonesian movements on making our ocean free from waste. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Lavinia and Jimmy, do you have something to add? Like, yeah, what can we do as people who live in the city um, to, you know, like, um, yeah, reduce plastic and yeah, to um, contribute more about the solutions? Uh, because yeah, some uh, some of our waste ends up in um, beaches in your island, things like that. So, do you have something that yeah, maybe you can inspire us? Um, yeah, just to um, be mindful of um, what you do with your um, rubbish. Um, in our work, um, mo um, a lot of the nets that we get are actually Indonesian net, mm -hmm. and they come um, travel down the currents into mm -hmm. Australian waters. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you know, like our waste travels so far. <laughs> yeah, but we turn it. We um, yeah recycle it, mm -hmm. turn it into art. I see. Okay, um, so uh, Bashana. <laughs> okay, um, just in addition to that, um, maybe the suggestion to see that what we are doing is affects something somewhere else. It's really important. I mean, I've lived in a city, I've lived in an island, and what I see is two different world, two mm. different disconnected world. So uh, maybe for us that living in the city, shall think more about where it will go, like in the mm -hmm. long term. And then for people who living in the islands or maybe in the coastal side, they will also see that this might be not your problems, but it will be your problems <laughs> because someone's doing it mm -hmm. in the in the downstream or the uh, mainstream. So that's why uh, what we have to do is actually to feel that we are connected each other. And then uh, things like this, I think it really helps. Yeah. So mm. people come up with awareness and people see like what we can do in our part. Um, well, especially what Tenia said is really true. So it's on the industry. Mm. If we can cut in the industry, then there will be no this rubbish everywhere. But however, uh, what I saw also in Labuan Bajo example, yeah, mm -hmm. the number of the plastic waste is not as much as in Jakarta, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's not feasibility economically to do something in a big for treatment or something like that. So it means it has to be uh, someone who always do something like community based or to reduce and to collect and to make it together. So uh, when in our place, it's actually we have like more than 30 communities that work on this plastic waste and we always happy if our number when we do clean up is less than before. So I think those kind of things we can do uh, every day. All right, thank you. And you touch on uh, the issue of community and also with Europe, everything that you do actually it's uh, very much a community based, community focused. And so I'd like to ask, like, what is the biggest challenge of working as a group, as a um, collective, especially like with Arab, uh, your uh, collective is uh, consists of people from different generations. Uh, what is the biggest challenge, and how do you overcome it? Oh uh, well, the, well, the biggest challenge for us is we always have to tend, turn to our elders mm -hmm. and ask them for advice and make sure when at the end of the artwork you, you'll, you'll have to end up with a story mm. and the story has to be straight sharp even 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 when we talk to our elders and we have to make sure that we carefully explaining to them if 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 they don't understand we probably get growl and say no do it properly way and like when we when we start to explain it properly for the elders and say we're just gonna put it into like for good, 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 good use and for good recycling. And they're gonna say, "Oh, okay, that's that's a good way to share the word out to everybody." And we also um, goes to PBC. Then the PBC end up talks to the elders for the island, the island, and then the, P the elders talk back to the PBC. Then the PBC said, "Yep, you guys can do it as long as it's." It's for a good cause and it's for a good recycle. And so that's 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 how we 
start by doing our art in Gosnev. So it is it is a good recycle plan and and also rangers rangers go rangers also encourage our fishermen and to manage manage our reef and because it's not only net plastic and water it's it, it's the climate change it's it's coming it's coming whether you like it or not the bleaching on the coral same as like what sister that then and the rising of tide was where, where, where I come from we've got like 40 30 islands around and on the middle islands some some of them islands are sand K and sand K once East, easterly wind and southeast wind once they move move across and nets come up it's, it's not only for the animal it's strangling the, the trees and once once it strang, strang, strangle the trees the nets go around the trees the tree dies the tree fall down and the sand go, goes with the tree and that's how the highland starts to come small so the word is to you have to have a story to explain about what's what what's ahead not not behind the person you don't walk behind it because if, if you're walking behind the person in the front if the person jumps over the cliff you jump over the cliff so you gotta think what's ahead of them like what's ahead do we have some some life for our, our generation at the front like like another sister that I was saying water what if we know water we're gonna drink salt water sister you're diving once you're gonna dive, it's gonna be all full of pollution underneath. There will be no Nemo to for for our generation to swim. Common things like that, you just gotta think and look ahead. Don't look back because it, it, if you're looking back, it's it's already at the front. So what you do is try and look further, look beyond the line, not behind the line, because behind the line it's if the fellow walk in front, if he does that, you'll have to follow too. So the, mo the thing that we can advise is to try think and make a better life and recycle and stay strong. And because end of the day, the climate will still come. If you like it or not, it's still gonna get you. So the moral of it is just to recycle a better way and make sure our generation takes that opportunity and go on further. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. That's so inspiring. Yeah, a round of applause, please. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, Tenia and uh, Shana, do you have something to add about yeah, what's your biggest challenge in working as a uh, yeah, community? Um, I think in Indonesia, the number of people that cares for environment is so small compared to people that cares for gossips, for example, or, or politics, things like that. Therefore, I think our biggest challenge, at least for the diverse community, is the lack of two things. Um, the first one is we are lack of narrators, narrators, yeah, the one that tells stories. Uh, therefore, I think this opportunity opportunity is a great opportunity opportunity to learn, because you know translating local wisdom, as you said earlier, from Iraq Arts Collective, it is really important, because sometimes our elders they are more afraid of you know ghosts or like you know um, local wisdom um, people uh, or like. You know, uh, what do you call it? Kayak uh, misalnya, nyirorokidul gitu. Mythology. <laughs> like yeah. mythology creatures and things like that. Because, you know, um, they are used to be afraid of it when they were children, right? Um, so I think having lots of local wisdom stories and having it uh, be told in a great and interesting way, such as using storytelling tell methods like arts or like movies, musics, um, things like that is really important and it is lacking in Indonesia so I think I believe those of you that come here are the art enthusiasts so I believe you know 
finding um, innovative way on telling stories about how we should care on, on how we actually should do is really important and needs to be you know broadened um, in several area not only in Jakarta but all over 17,000 small islands in Indonesia because we have a lot of unique local wisdom such as hukum adat sasi etc where we actually are obliged to protect the oceans uh, especially not just cutting the ghost uh, the fishing gears on the oceans and be left to be found on your country things like that so I think um, local wisdom is one of the way and storytelling are the one that we are still seeking for and the second one is the policy because as what we understand we need to make people not for example dumping their fishing gears on the oceans right if there is no punishments if there is no you know incentives for them to collect it recycle it putting on the drop boxes they will not doing it because it's cheaper for them just to dump it on the oceans right so I think making a policy change is really important but to make a policy change we need bigger people to communicate about it so I think um, that's what you can um, do as well supporting communities um, issues and also policy changes uh, from your own home thank you okay um, Yes, we're facing uh, the common perspective about talking about the environment, actually, that um, most of them um, never connect with each other, like I already mentioned before. Yeah? So um, maybe we have to mingle more, mm -hmm. and then we have to cross sectors more. Mm -hmm. uh, we also experience that um, from, like, for example, like tourism sectors that don't understand, understand what transportation sectors do and things like that. Well, if people put this as a common issue or discussion or a basic issue, I think everyone will uh, have the, what is it called, like, personalize the issue within themselves. It's the most important thing. And uh, what we had also, uh, I thought like the local people is uh, not really aware about the environment. Well, they, actually they aware, but they don't know what they do. It will harm more than it's before. So because for example, like people in an island, before they never know this single-use uh, plastic. Yeah, so it's already provided by the industry. Uh, so beforehand, they don't care. So because when they throw something in the ocean, it will be just gone, just like that, gone to the other country. So it's amazingly, uh, we have to uh, bring all the education and start from local little children. So I think it's the most important thing. And uh, we already experienced that talking with the children is more helpful uh, because they will tell everyone and the whole family will come up and support. Um, and last but not least, of course, you have to, maybe sometimes we have to create like one boundaries of all, or like one destination, for example, like that you can behave like that here, for example. Then people will train and see it can work, so why don't it can be adapted in another place? So that's also the idea that why we choose Labuan Bajo is because people thinking about the dragon, sustainability, and etc. And when they come, it's easier to put their mindset in a leisure time <laughs> that we fill it with you have to protect your environment, you have to stop using plastic, and etc. So maybe those kind of issues can be. So we will have the more popular way to introduce this either than only one single or one small community that's talking about environment. That's Thank you. So now we have time um, uh, for questions from uh, the audience. Uh, I think you still have like two to, uh, time for two to three questions. So anyone want to ask qu some questions to, the, to any speakers? Yeah, okay. I'll come to you. Hello, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful presentations every, uh, to all speakers. Uh, I would like to ask a simple question. Uh, what would you like to say to people who uh, are trying to perhaps do what you do, but like maybe don't know where to start or like uh, what do you think uh, the steps that they should take in order to pursue what you're doing right now? Thank you. Okay, very nice questions. Um, Yes, so who would like to start? I think it's addressed to everyone. Um, yeah, I think because I will be the one that uh, easier to answer, just start with your hobby. <laughs> just like me, I start with scuba diving as a hobby, so I'm looking forward 
um, to you know combine my hobby with a solution that I can take. Therefore, shout out to the volunteers there. <laughs> they love the oceans. They love traveling. They love divers. They're shy. They don't want to <laughs> raise their hands. Uh, but because they do from their hobby, they start with their hobby. It feels like less burden for them, right? And they're doing what they love. So I think, um, of course, everybody have hobby, even though it's not environment or outdoor things such as for example if you love to make videos or like you you, you love to draw or like you you make art installations do something about it and just you know in, uh, include the messages or the solutions that can be taken in your own community of hobby i think that's just one simple step um and my additional suggestion is uh you have to study more like find more information like be more open from where you stand now maybe the not another world that you never know before so traveling will be one of the how to do that and find a place that you don't have any signal so you have this detox thing it really helps you to discover what actually you're looking for so not only just hobby but you will be i think everyone has this role yeah like some special role that god have given you and you have to just go and do that so uh, just start, and when you decide to start, uh, surprisingly, things will happen to support you. At the moment, compared to like 12 years ago when we just started, it's definitely easier way. People more aware. Post-pandemic, definitely exponentially people aware about the environment and so on. So we, you have a lot of support system at the moment, a lot of incubators, accelerator, community, um, environment enthusiasts, and etc. So start now because we have to face this together. So. As soon as possible, we were ready to support you. Um, for us in Australia, um, when we travel around Australia with um, like exhibiting our installations, we um, always do workshops with um, GhostNet workshops with um, students, um, school students, and also um, staff at like museums and and just. Um, community that wants to get involved um, just like the the workshops we did here with the kids this morning and yesterday morning um, yeah you know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. well if you want to have a start you always have to build build a foundation if you don't have a foundation the building will fall if you get a good foundation, and always turn to your elders for advice. Because our elders was living way past before us. As long as you build your foundation, you've got a better chance of succeed what's ahead of you. And, and also, yeah, as like for the school children, that's, that's one of the foundation you, you start off. Then you move on, as you move on, you build your own confidence and you probably say, okay, I'm, I'm ready for it. Then that turns to your elders. Then the elders are gonna give you advice and always tell your elders, this is for a good cause. If you don't tell the elders the right thing, you're gonna get growled there one time. You're gonna get told and you're gonna say, oh, well, I'm doing something wrong. So go back again and start building your foundation again. Try, try another way to approach your elders. And the elders is the better way of starting your career. And if you want to succeed, then you'll, 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 you'll succeed. Then you get to go everywhere and to share your art and share your knowledge with other people. And, and, then, and that's how, and, and that's how when you go, go ahead and do it, then that's how you uh, build relation and future with other people. And the other ones are gonna start to come back with you and follow you as you go through your path and yeah, that's about it yeah as long as you've got a strong foundation you're right as long as you've got a workshop happening with kids you're set thank you right. thank you um any more questions ada pertanyaan lagi Thank you for the opportunity and thank you to all speakers for the insight. So beforehand, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Pramita. I am from Manpat. I am a student in Manpat. 
in the southeast of Jakarta. And coming from a child, I am still very young, and I see myself and my friends being very aware of our environment, but apparently, whenever we're trying to influence other people, oftentimes we are underestimated because they say, you're still young, you're, you're just a child, what do you know about the world? So my question is, how may we be heard by people? How can we convince people to trust us, to care about our world and also our ocean? That's all, thank you. All right, um, tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, my suggestion is, uh, of course, when we start, we always start from zero. So you have to accept that we start from nobody, of course. And then after that, you have to record it or uh, try to quantify or like maybe like make notes of what you are doing. So you will know yourself how already you give the impact. At least you know for yourself. And never uh, start with want to becoming acknowledged by someone else. It's not the how it goes, actually, yeah, because uh, what we already start at the first is actually what is your mission? Why you want to do this? Why we want to do this? And you have to answer it like five times wise to yourself, because when you already say five times, okay, I want to do this, then do it. You are the one who want to do the job, not someone else. And then I know in, this, in these days, a lot of uh, FOMO, say, I, I fear missing out, things like that. Uh, so let's bring this energy to protect the environment, for example. So let's people make, it's not cool if you are not care about the environment, things like that. And what I know also and what I experience is you have to spend 10,000 hours on what you do to make sure you master on it. So, if it's not 10,000 hours yet, so don't stop, because it's still on the process, just like that. <laughs> okay, I think um, because I started not that young as you, uh, I started in 17 or 18 years old during my university students, so I somehow understand what you felt, um, and I think uh, the only way uh, for us to, you know, never give up is don't don't be like a frog inside a box you know you need sometimes you need to get out of the box open that box out and then you can jump everywhere um, and one of the way is actually by utilizing the opportunities of grants and workshops for youth because as you know and you google it like so many opportunities for youth and children at your age so for example the australia award in indonesia they have a lot of short courses they have webinars they have networking events just by going to that way even though you're not yet having a solution or something um, just be there uh, surround yourself with those wonderful people and sometimes the grants and acknowledgement comes with you uh, because uh, maybe your your surrounding not yet appreciating changes uh, but other people are appreciating it so I think one of the way is finding that opportunities and Australia Embassy has a lot of um, offers for that and the second one is actually um, find the local champions because I am really inspired by what you're doing in Iraq Arts uh, and what also we uh, we found on the Asia Pacific community or Islanders community you know we have local champions in every area right we call it tokoh agama the religious leader for example in Indonesia if we have that endorsement they will help you to be heard in your own community. For example, in school, if you have the acknowledgement and endorsement from your head of schools, for example, the headmaster, it will be easier to you know, make the other teachers support your causes. Um, therefore, I think sometimes we are you know, too lazy to hear about the elders, what they're saying right in Indonesia, but actually having their endorsement um, from the local elders is really beneficial for our work. I think that's just one uh, two tips that you can take. Thank you. Yeah, as for girl one day, if you if you want to start something, don't start off with a big words. Start off small. 
and work your way through the track. As you go, as you walk through the path and build your, build your confidence. If, you, if you're going to start a big word and then you say, what, what are you talking about? See, that's the answer you're going to get back. So it's possible that you start off slow and make sure you build up your, your, your confidence first. And, and take every opportunity that you got. Always look for your elders. Always look for your, ask for advice. Then you get up on the stage and start up small. If, you, if, if you're going to start up using a bigger word, that the, the, big, the one big fella in front of you is going to say, it's too small for you to use the word. Does he know what the big word mean? So you best you pull back, start off slow, and build your confidence. Make sure you've got everything behind you. Then once you're going to stand up and say the big word, then it's like, ah, oh, so he's on to something. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. So I suppose uh, we ran out of time, unfortunately. But thank you so much, everyone, for your energy, your insights, and this engaging discussions. Thank you um, for, yeah, for being present and for joining us in the session. So yeah, as uh, we've learned in the past hour, um, we are aware about the state of our oceans. And uh, in a way, it's very scary uh, to know about the ocean pollution, the marine debris. But at the same time, it's also hopeful to learn that there's been many efforts made to address this challenge. And as we've heard from each speaker, there's many ways to approach this issue. Art is one of the entry point, and also collective work is uh, definitely uh, one of the ways to approach it because you can't do it alone. Um, but again, it's never like an instant solution. Everything takes process, so it's, uh, it's good if you want to start to start small and be consistent because uh, eventually, you'll get there and you'll find people who share uh, your similar goals, goals as well. So I hope uh, this uh, moment right here is a starting point for us to be more aware of the issue and be more actively engaged in working to find the solutions together. So once again, I'd like to thank the speakers today and everyone who supported this project, uh, the team at Machan, and also our friends at the Australian Embassy in Indonesia, uh, Qantas, CSRO, Komodo Water, Diverse Clean Action, and of course, Iraq Arts, uh, who's been, um, yeah, who make us come together today. And uh, Ghost Nets Awakening the Drifting Giants uh, is still presented here at Museum Machan until 4th of June. So make your way to the museum to experience it yourself. And also, don't forget, when you're in there, you can also create your own manta ray. Um, and for the latest, latest news on our upcoming programs, please stay tuned uh, on our social media channels. And um, yeah, so we hope to see you again in the museum in our next events. Uh, stay safe, take care, and have a good weekend, everyone.